I'm speeding. 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 Five, four, three, two, one. The world is changing faster than ever. What used to take decades is now taking years or even months. What you see right now is the illusion that people have had for many decades about the workplace being the secure place to, to work the rest of your life. For the first time in the history of our nation, our children will not do as well as us. We've seen our friends get laid off, we've been laid off, we've had our pay cut. People are overworked and underpaid. They seem to have less time and less freedom. They live under constant pressure. This is gonna be forced. And so even if your employer loves you, you may, they may have to cut you. There's something wrong that on Monday morning, the heart attack rate increases by 35%. Technology is accelerating, job security is declining. It just doesn't seem like the old models of making a living are as reliable as they used to be. Every aspect of our lives, there's a better way out there, but we're still doing it the old way. We live in the greatest country on the planet, and there are a lot of people sitting around complaining and being cynical. Like everyone's whining about this old model, and I'm like, why don't you leave it? Look at all this over here, look at all this opportunity. Since so much of our lives revolve around our work and the way we make our living, many people are thinking there just has to be a better way. The biggest challenge facing our world today is not making money, is what are we going to do with all the displaced unemployed people? People are afraid that they're going to make the wrong decision. People are afraid of the unknown. People are afraid that maybe I don't have the skills. Hey, sports fans. Industrial age is dead over. It's dead. It's dying. That's why going to school to get a job is an obsolete idea. A steady paycheck is an industrial age idea. It's the search for answers that has brought us here together today. My name is Eric Worre, and for almost 30 years, I've been an entrepreneur, struggling at times, but ultimately succeeding. As a best-selling author, speaker, and business owner, I've spent my entire career helping millions of people around the world to become entrepreneurs. And I believe strongly that there is, in fact, a better way when it comes to how we make a living. The career landscape has changed dramatically, and many are still working in a model that is completely out of date. What worked for previous generations isn't working as well for people today. In this film, we're gonna explore three important questions. First, what's really going on in our working world today? Second, in this new economy, is it better to become an entrepreneur, or is it safer to work for someone else? And third, if a person decides to become an entrepreneur and start their own business, how can they do it without taking on massive risk? To help in this journey, I've brought together some of the greatest experts and thought leaders in the field of entrepreneurship to share the real facts with you. My intention is to give you new information that will allow you to make choices that are not limited by an old, outdated model. Let's start by understanding what's going on in our working world today. Let's look at unemployment. 30, 40% of the people are honestly not working, but would be working. What our government does is if you haven't found a job in six months, we don't call you unemployed. We pretend you dropped out of the labor force. I've often said that unemployment, particularly structural unemployment, that's unemployment due to technological changes, is the first sign of economic growth. Think of it, 10 people live on an island. They go out every day and fish. One day, new technology shows up. A missionary brings them a net. Now, using the net, one pilots the boat, one throws the net, two fishermen can do all the work 10 used to. That's a 500% increase in productivity, two doing the work of 10, in one day. You don't have to learn a lot to learn how to throw a net instead of throw a fishing line. The island's got a big problem, 80% unemployment but the island still has all the wealth of the fish because the two people produce as much fish as 10 did. Now, of course, looking back in history, these changes used to take thousands of years. And during that time, we went into farming and transportation. Some of us became doctors and some teachers and lawyers, and we developed all these new professions and new manufacturing jobs. Today, these changes are occurring literally in one day when a new technological advance occurs, and we don't have the social structures to deal with it or to retrain the unemployed people. 
So one of the things that I think is interesting as I travel across the country and really travel around the world is the way that we work and the way we get paid for work is changing pretty dramatically. On a global basis, everything is being turned upside down because of the rapidly advancing technologies. Uh, they are eliminating many jobs and we have been left with many people not prepared for the jobs that exist. A lot of demand in public companies was to squeeze out all the fat and to get just as much margin as we possibly could and fat equals humans. So this idea of job security and information age is so obsolete but it's still taught inside our school system. And that's where the problem starts. There's no financial education in school system, and people are still trained to be employees to work for that paycheck. This is a chart on the middle class. What's happening in the middle class, those that went to school, their incomes have been coming down for years. And parents still say to the kids, go to school, get a job. Now what happens to all those middle class people who are dropping off the ends of the, off the chart? Well, they become what's called working poor. And this is what happens to working poor. But they say poverty is ending. Well, poverty may be ending, but working poverty is going up. And this is food stamp usage. So food stamp usage in America is going through the roof right now because people cannot earn what they call a living wage. Most people have experienced financial pressures that I think are probably greater than they have been in the past. If you're not working for yourself then, it's going to be a pretty hard road for a lot of people. Today, if you're going to control your future, the 40-40 plan is gone where you can graduate from college and get a job and work for 40 hours a week for 40 years. That day is gone. So some of these charts actually tell you what's going on. And this is a really interesting one, you know. People are going back to school because if I go back to school, I'll get a nice job. But this is what's happening to, it's called Sally Mae, which is the student loan guys. Student loan is going through the roof. It's now over a trillion dollars. And student loan debt is worse than credit card debt. So when people stop using credit card, the government got people into Sally or student loan debt. And student, the problem with student loan debt is you can never be forgiven. See, with credit card debt, you can declare bankruptcy and then all's forgiven. But student loan debt, you can de declare bankruptcy, you still owe it. It's the, it's the worst of all debt. But this is the next picture. Look at this chart here. This is what's happening to wages of college graduates. It's going down. So you go to college, you rack up all this debt, but you earn less money. Now, that's not that intelligent. Average person who's been working a lifetime in America today is ending their lifetime at 65 with about $41,000 in assets. They earned just enough to survive. I think in the United States we have something like 17 trillion in, in debt. That's just the, gov the federal government debt. We got another two in municipal and in other, let, let's call it almost 20 trillion government. We've got 40 trillion in private debt. That comes up to close to 60 trillion. When you then add something we never had before, what you're talking about, when we look at the unfunded portion of Social Security and primarily Medicare, Medicaid, that, at the most conservative estimates from outside firms, Kleiner Perkins, $67 trillion and growing. That's, a, that's more than all our other debt. There's less conservative estimates that say it's $84 trillion or higher. I added up conservatively $127 trillion in total debt. Debt is a financial drug. When you take it to excess, it's like taking a drug. Yeah, it makes you feel better, it enhances your performance, but at a huge cost, eventually it kills you. And, and so that's what happens. We keep doing more and more debt and you get less and less results, just like a drug, until the debt gets so high that it crushes the whole system. That's where we're at, 8.2 times GDP. You know who I feel sorry for? I feel sorry for the person who dreads going to work, who is sick to their stomach on Monday morning, who hates their alarm clock, who gets a little glimmer of hope on a Wednesday because it's hump day, and says, thank God it's Friday and they live for those two days a week where they get to be themselves and get, they don't have to be around people they don't, they don't like and they don't have to play the political game in the office and they don't have to live this half-life. Um, the person that works 50 weeks a year just to be able to have the two weeks for vacation. And you know what happens to most of them nowadays? 
They don't have a vacation. They have a staycation. They have time off of work, but they don't get to go where they want to go because they're overextended. They've got all this debt. They got all this situation. They hate their alarm clock. They're, they can't sleep until they're done. They have to spend most of their life in traffic. I feel sorry for that group of people because there's a better way. They just don't know it. I see this really interesting attempt at rugged individuality in a six by eight rectangle. And I feel like you're all the same, uh, except for the little push pins of the pictures. There's different pictures. Yours is named Jenny and his is named uh, Sujara, but it's the same people. And this is how they are. And they're just like the zombies and there's no joy in there. There's no fun. There's always like the wacky woman who decorates her cubicle. And that, that's, that's the most she can do there. You got to give her credits, right? The, the wacky cubicle woman. The basis for their life is worry. I'm, I'm worried, you know, maybe I'll get fired. I'm worried maybe my company will go out of business. I'm worried I can't keep split, spinning the plates on paying the bills. I'm worried about how do I send my kids to college. I'm worried, what if the transmission of my car breaks? That's, you know, two or three. I can't fix it. People live in a, in a sea of worry and it eats at them. Those signs that people held up during the depression didn't say looking for gainful employment in a cubicle. It said looking for work. Work is what we're looking for. Job is just a unit of measurement. Work is what we're going after. It's time to look in the mirror and say, it's not the economy, it's my economy. It's my little world of where I am. I need to improve. I'm not gonna wait for the economy to come back because frankly, the economy is doing great in this country. So I'm here on Wall Street, the financial center of the universe, the financial capital of the world. This is where most people's money goes to at least be held for a time, right? With interest rates in banks being effectively zero, and many experts are predicting it's gonna stay at zero for the next 10, 20, even 30 years, people feel like they don't have any choice but to put their future into equities, to put their future into the hands of other people on this stock market, and hope that the stock market goes up. Hope that the stocks that their advisors pick or that they pick goes up. That's one way to go, I guess. It's my personal belief that if you put your future into the hands of yourself, in other words, you have earning power by yourself, I think you're a better investment than these guys. I think you can, controlling your future is a better option than handing over your retirement to these guys. The average household income in the United States is approximately $50,000 a year, what they call the middle class. To reach the top 25% of income earners, you'd need to earn at least 90,000 a year. To reach the top 10% would be a household income of 140,000, the top 5% 190,000, and to be in the top 1%, you'd need a combined household income of at least $380,000 a year. So here's the question. What do you think would give you the best chance to move up and get to the top 10%, the top 5%, the top 1% or beyond? In my opinion, and in the opinion of many, many experts, the answer is to become an entrepreneur, to become your own boss. I think you have to be a business owner. I, I can't, the only time I ever say to someone it'd be great to be an employee is when they've already told me they've surrendered. I only tell people who are uh, wounded spiritually that they should be an employee. And it's that feeling that you get when you uh, pick up the backpack off the little Cub Scout and say, don't worry, little guy, we'll get you back to the camp. You know, it is not a, it is in no way a kindness when I tell someone they'd be a great employee. The other status symbol really increasingly is lifestyle. I mean, people can own their own business, maybe even work out of their house. That, I tell you, people admire that. Like, gosh, I wish I could do that. The spirit of the entrepreneur is to be a risk taker and to be resourceful and unstoppable and to have a vision of yourself beyond where you are and not willing to settle for life as it is. Think about the great entrepreneurs. They're visionary. They have heart. They're willing to do today what others want so they can do tomorrow what others can't. Personally, I don't think of the new economy, the old economy. I create my own economy. The entrepreneur's in control. I decide what the economy is going to be like. In the world of entrepreneurship, there are no limits. You can make as much as you want, depending on how much you want to work and how smart you are and how great a team you put together. 
There's no more lifetime rewarding business than being an entrepreneur. Why in America, where anyone could be anything, would people want to give up their freedom and become effectively a modern day slave, told shut up and be here every morning at 7.30, leave at 5.30, and do what I tell you? If people decide to become an entrepreneur and work for themselves, they have some traditional options, but they're riskier than you might think. Any kind of a retail business, retail build-outs, is extremely expensive. Um, even just these small little yogurt stores, where they're putting little yogurt uh, machines and you get all the different flavors, you're spending two, three, four hundred grand to open a yogurt shop. I would love to buy a Dunkin' Donuts, but it's a half a million or so to start. I don't quite have that just in case money. Risking lose it all, and most guys do two or three times, and even big guys like Branson, because I'm such a fan of his, half his companies don't work. If you make a million, your problems are going to go. If you make a billion, your problems are really going to go. Just the opposite. You and I know when you're making a million, you get a million responsibilities. You make a billion, you get a thousand times a million responsibilities. And most people say, I'd love to be my own boss. 70% of Americans would love to be their own boss, according to recent polls. But they don't know how to get there. Because what are you going to do? One, you could buy an existing business. If somebody's selling an existing business, you have to ask why. <laughs> Usually because it's probably hard. Uh, it's probably not making as much money as they hope. Two, they could buy a franchise. A little less risk, proven system. But it's expensive to be able to do that. Three, they could start something from scratch. And that's where a lot of people feel like, I don't have the, the chops to do it. I don't have the money. I don't have the, the product idea. I don't have the expertise. I don't have whatever it's going to take to be able to get there. And I can't risk my family to do it. So fourth, they could become an investor. A lot of people in this town invest uh, to try and figure out a way, but you got to be pretty smart with that game too, right? Venture capitalists, who are the very best and most sophisticated in investing in new breakthrough businesses, make it on one out of 11. That means 10 out of 11 are mediocre or fail. Most of them fail. That's the risk there. An angel investor is lucky to get one out of 15 or 20. A business is a team sport. Like I have to have accountants, I have to have engineers, I have to have system designers, I have to have sales, marketing, I have to have accounting, I have to have admission statements, I have to have legal and all that. The average Joe Schmo, even me, I go out there, I don't have the skills to, to put a business together. I think the bottom line for the four traditional options is they take money, sometimes a lot of it, they take expertise, and they take time. All of that adds up to just too much risk for most people. I bought a business from somebody else and it was a lot of work. And you know, you start wondering, what did I just buy? Because I guess ultimately I own your email list and I just overpaid for it. People that start their own business, they spend a lot of money, they spend a lot of time, a lot of effort to get things started. And the more you invest on the upfront, the harder you typically work at it. I can tell you what the success rate is of a restaurant. If what is it? They're crazy enough. About 90% of them fail. About 90% in, in how, how quickly? Uh, year year less wow and if we're talking non-franchise we're talking franchise sure. that's totally different yeah but our students aren't getting franchise rest you gotta you gotta invest a big money exactly and with someone like mcdonald's you've had to work with the company for a long period of time really know the even have a chance of investing a million have a chance and yeah. it's a slim chance what if there was a way that you had all the proven aspects the comfort aspects and you could still control your own life what if there was both in other words, you didn't have to create everything from scratch. You, could, you didn't have to be a super leader. All you had to do, what if there was a proven product already? You didn't have to create the product. And there's a proven system already, proven training already. Everything except an employer. That was the only thing that you didn't have. Do you think more people would be open to, to working for themselves in that environment? In our search for a better way to make a living, we've come to the conclusion that becoming an entrepreneur is actually safer than being an employee. And through our look at the entrepreneurial options, one particular path kept coming up from expert after expert. And I think most people will find it surprising because it's certainly a non-traditional business model. That model is for people to start their own business and become an entrepreneur through the creation of a network marketing business. 
Some people call it direct selling because the product is being sold directly from the manufacturer to the end consumer, cutting out the middlemen. Other people call it multi-level marketing or MLM because there are multiple levels of commissions paid. The most common term today is network marketing because network marketing best describes using a large group of independent distributors, independent entrepreneurs, to move a product or service more efficiently. So my friend here, Donald Trump and I, we always write about the network marketing industry. And the reason we support the network marketing industry is because it really is a business school for entrepreneurs. Because most people come out of school looking for a paycheck. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. I went to network marketing like that. I think if it didn't exist, we should invent it. It is that good. I think direct selling is a great way to do business today. It's uh, very easy to get into that industry and you can be self-employed, be in effect an entrepreneur. When we see multi-billionaires adding network marketing companies to their portfolio of companies, that would be a clue. When we see people who are very famous authors and very famous business people endorsing the industry, that would be a clue. These network marketing companies aren't $50 million companies, they're billions and billions of dollars. They lead the stock market, they're major companies. When we're going to get it, do you know, and you're going to school to work for a paycheck, but if you want to be rich, be an entrepreneur, and network marketing gives you the spirit to be an entrepreneur. A traditional company will spend up to 50% of their total revenue on marketing. Network marketing companies use a different approach. Instead of having all that extensive marketing expense, they utilize a network of independent distributors to do the marketing for them. Now, why do they do this? First, because word of mouth advertising is so much more effective today than traditional media advertising. Second, some products need to be explained or demonstrated, and an independent salesperson can do that more effectively than an ad campaign. Third, it's completely efficient. The company only pays for the marketing of their product if a sale happens and not before. Imagine if Amazon allowed you to become an independent distributor and paid out 40% of its revenue to that distributor group. All you had to do as a distributor was recommend a product. And if a person bought it on Amazon, Amazon would take care of all the logistics and you'd get paid for bringing the customer. Now imagine you got paid for every purchase that customer made for the rest of their lives. Well, Amazon doesn't offer this option, but network marketing companies do. 85% of all buying decisions in our society are made as a result of word of mouth or reputation. We're recommending things to each other all the time. You know, who's your dentist? Who's your doctor? Who's your lawyer? What detergent, you know, are you using? What legal system are you using? What product are you using? We're, we're talking to each other about the things that we love anyway. When you go into a big box retailer, you're lucky if the clerk looks you in the eye, much less gives you any detailed or accurate information about what you're purchasing. Uh, so, of course, this personal information, this education coming from a friend, a neighbor, a relative, or even a stranger, but who, one who has experience with the product is extraordinarily valuable. As a matter of fact, uh, network marketing can educate consumers probably better than any other form of marketing. It certainly can do better than advertising because advertising usually has a certain hype to it and you can only get limited information. So, you know, network marketing trumps advertising. If you were a typical sales company and you wanted to sell a million dollars a month worth of product, you might go find a hundred superstar salespeople. The quota would be $10,000 a month. So network marketing as a distribution system just flips the numbers. So we use 10,000 happy, raving fans of a particular product. And we don't concern ourselves so much with how much product each one of them individually sells. If they sell just a hundred or $200 a month, and there's 10,000 of them, you're selling a million to two million dollars a month worth of product. And that's the best way I can explain how network marketing works. This is the marketing arm of the company. There's not money being wasted on bricks and mortar. There's not money being wasted on inventory that's sitting stagnant somewhere. There's not of employees standing around that don't have customers. These are people that are going to connect with customers. These companies allow people to become independent distributors for extremely low cost and with no minimum time or sales quota. Essentially, they own their own business and can provide as much or as little sales as they choose. In other words, the distributor gets all the benefits of traditional business ownership without the risk. The advantage of network marketing is 
the ease of entry, the low risk, and the low startup cost, because almost everything else has very high risk. You can get in for a minimal investment. You're buying into a system that's already been proven, products or services that have been proven to work. The keys to network marketing is providing an opportunity for the masses to get involved, providing an opportunity for the average person who doesn't have the resources to start their own business. All of this so far is fairly straightforward, but network marketing offers another benefit and it's this benefit that makes it so interesting for entrepreneurs. Network marketing allows a distributor to build their own network of other distributors and then compensates them on the sales created by that entire group. Direct selling is, at its base, very simple. It's the sale of a product or service to an individual on a face-to-face, one-on-one basis, just the way we're talking right now. But there's an important element as well, and that's the offering in con conjunction with that sale of product, the offering of an opportunity, an opportunity for someone to make something of themselves. No matter what your social status is, no matter what language that you speak, I mean, look how many unbelievable people are becoming successful to speak every kind of language out there. What an awesome gift to give the world. Instead of having to work your way up in a system and prove that you could be a sales manager, they just decided everybody can be a sales manager. Everybody gets to build a sales team from day one. And so what that brought into the system of growth as a direct selling company is the concept of compounding or geometric progression. Because now you can actually grow Salesforce very quickly because everybody is enrolling people in their own sales force. People who are like, oh, this is weird, I'm building a sales team, or what do you think you do at a regular company? How do you think a regular company works? Network marketing is the only industry that doesn't say your past determines your future. It looks at your past and says, okay, now what can we train you to do so you can have a great future? Every other employer out there wants to exploit you for what you already know, not teach you something new. Network marketing has a potential to save the United States and the world because it's gonna teach people not to be employees, but to be entrepreneurs. According to the Direct Selling Association, if you add up all the network marketing companies around the world, they combine to do over $178 billion a year in retail sales. To give you an idea of how big that really is, the NFL, the National Football League, does approximately $9 billion a year. The music industry does a little more than $16 billion a year, and the movie industry does about $80 billion a year. Using a conservative average, network marketing companies pay their distributors about 40% of that $178 billion in the form of commissions, which adds up to more than $71 billion a year. That's almost $6 billion a month. It's almost $200 million in commissions every single day. So it's certainly working, and people are making serious money in network marketing. With the growth of the direct selling industry over the last 10, 15, 20 years, we've seen a broader understanding of the channel. We have seen more and more people getting involved in the business. So our penetration in the marketplace has increased, and thus the understanding in the marketplace of who we are has increased. And we've seen non-direct selling companies look at the direct selling model and say, something's going on there. People are making money, companies are being profitable, individuals are being motivated, product is being delivered to market. Maybe we should explore this. Some people think only the people at the top make money. Well, let's take a look at that as well. In the network marketing profession, there are roughly 500 people in the world who earn over a million dollars a year. If you round that number up to two million dollars a year, that adds up to about a billion dollars a year. That takes the $71 billion paid out each year down to $70 billion. So where does the rest of the money go? The vast majority goes to part-time people making anywhere from a few hundred dollars a month to many thousands of dollars a month. It goes to people who choose to make it a full-time career move and earning even more than that. Every day, people are using the money they earn through network marketing to pay off debt, have more fun, and improve the quality of their lives. Everyone I know in network marketing has been doing that since the 50s. They go to work when they want to go to work. They stop working when they want to take time with their children to have a leisurely breakfast and discuss issues and drive them to school. They go back to work when they get home, wherever they're working out of. The biggest thing that I've seen is people that have become much happier 
in their life. MLM has probably made more millionaires of more people in more countries, and I've spoken to them in 50, 67 countries than any other single form of business, starting from nothing. If they have a choice between working a job for the next 10 years or working a network marketing business for the next 10 years, the result of working the network marketing business will be better. A lot of people within the industry go on and make this a career um, and do extremely, extremely well at it. Network marketing has been nothing but good for everyone I know that's been involved with it because they did it seriously and they played full out and they've been very successful. It's been a constant barrage of success stories and um, people showing off stuff <laughs> they got as a result of it. How many people are involved? Approximately 16 million Americans and 96 million people around the world are currently participating in network marketing. And in a recent poll, 82% of those people report a good, very good, or excellent experience with network marketing. So people are happy. So I've taken a look at the network marketing profession and really tried to understand why so many people are confused as to the validity of this as a business. One is this pyramid shape. People get really messed up with this pyramid. Oh, it's one of those pyramid things. <laughs> so I just think there are a lot of haters out there who really don't understand the industry and say, oh, it's a, it's a get rich quick scheme. It's a pyramid. Well, corporate America is a pyramid scheme. You know what I mean? It goes like this. You have thousands of MBAs, you know, let's say working for Ford or General Motors or Coca-Cola. If all of these MBAs, they're all trying to get to here. That's a pyramid. Only one guy's going to make it. You know, every 10 years, one's going to make it. Whereas you look at network market, it's like this. So you're here and your job is to develop other CEOs coming up behind you. So it's an inverse pyramid. In network marketing, it's a very simple concept. If you sell product, you get paid. It is paid based on production. There is no first mover's advantage. There is no investment component where the more somebody spends, the more they're entitled to make. So the two are polar opposites of each other. It doesn't matter what shape the company is or the compensation plan is shaped, whether it's a circle or a pyramid or a triangle or a trapezoid, it doesn't matter. If compensation is coming primarily from recruitment, then you've got a problem. On the other hand, if an operation is basing their compensation to participants on the basis of sales, even when those sales are generated by people you've recruited, well, then you're a perfectly legitimate enterprise. That's the legal test. It's the practical test. Another issue that's been true in the past that is no longer true now is people used to be in network marketing loaded up with products that they couldn't sell and they ended up a loser. They ended up with a bunch of product in their garage, they ended up with a bunch of products sitting in their kitchen shelves or whatever, and they thought they could sell it and then they weren't willing to or able to sell it and they ended up with a bunch of stuff and they were bitter about it. There was this thing called front loading where you had to buy like, well, if you bought $25,000 of the product, you got better commissions and all this. Today, it's almost all done by computer, it's direct mail comes from a warehouse somewhere else, you don't have to have all this inventory, you don't have to stock up. It's a paperless world now, you know, uh, most of it's done online, you have a back office, it really works, and I mean, the technology has changed everything. Third issue is people start talking about 99% of people in network marketing don't make any money. Well, we've talked about that over the course of this uh, journey together. Almost $200 million a day is being paid out to network marketing distributors around the world. The naysayers, the people who say that it doesn't work, are usually the ones who just don't know how to make it work for themselves. And so they're giving you an opinion. And I tell people, don't confuse people's opinions with expertise, because opinions are free. And don't confuse sincerity with the truth, because people can be sincerely wrong. But here's the reality inside of network marketing. The vast majority of people that get involved in network marketing just become customers and they get involved to be able to purchase product at a lower price. If you take a Costco as an example, if a person goes into Costco and gets a membership to Costco so they can get a lower price on the product, we don't call that person a loser because they have a bunch of product that they walked out with with a smile on their face. Yet, when some people want to take a look at network marketing, they say, well, those people, they're just using the product and they aren't earning an income, so they must be a loser. They're not a loser, they're a happy customer. 
That's the vast majority of people that are involved in network marketing. Now, a smaller percentage of those, those people decide to go build a business. They earn 300 a month, 500 a month, 1,000, 2,000. That's the bulk of earnings in network marketing. And then there's the few that really decide to take it serious, really decide to build a large network, really work to make that network very, very productive. And those people make huge amounts of money and there's no cap. What I do as an outside economist, just somebody looking at this industry like any other industry I speak and say, look, what's the realities of this? 1% do incredibly well. 10% generate some additional income at pretty low risk and, 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 and effort, That's not, and 90% and of people roughly end up customers. One thing that uh, I think is real when it comes to people's perceptions about network marketing is people put this, and distributors I think, involved in network marketing have some responsibility for this. They have sometimes unrealistic claims about the product or about the income. Most people who become distributors they want the money, they want to be successful, but they don't have the skills. They don't know what to do. And when people don't know what to do and they're in a new business, they're scared. And when they're scared, they, they panic and desperation kind of sets in. So they think everyone they talk to has to get in. So if I talk to you and you say, well, no, I don't have time to do that. They're like, no, 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 I need you. You, you have to do this or I won't be sick. So I, I start clawing on you. I start that, that desperation. So then I start making claims about the product, which are not appropriate, probably not even true. Or I start saying, oh, you, let me show you how you can make all this money and you don't have to do anything, Eric. And, and so you, you just totally misrepresent the opportunity and you, you're clingy with people because you think you need everybody to be successful, and you don't. You know, one of the messages that I, I try to deliver most forcefully to companies as well as salespeople in direct selling is that you don't have to overpromise. The reality is in network marketing, there's a lot of hard work involved. There's a lot of effort. You're gonna have to develop yourself. It's a business like anything else. It's gonna take some time, but in my opinion, it's better. It's light years better for people starting today than it was even five years ago. I, I think it's more widely accepted now and people understand it is a business. It is being an entrepreneur. It is being a business owner. Our belief system is based upon our evaluation of something. And frequently, if we reevaluate a situation, our belief about that situation will change. The industry has changed and it's grown up. It's totally transformed. You've got young people today um, that have grown up with social media and they understand networks. They understand how people are connected through technology and they understand how money flows through those networks. So when they see network marketing, they don't see it the way their parents saw it. And we've all learned, uh, we, the, the, the larger industry that you represent, has all learned from those mistakes and flaws and errors that have happened early on. Early algorithms didn't work the right way. That's all fixed. It's like when they design a computer program, uh, they design the program, then they run it, and then they go back through and they debug it. The MLM industry has been debugged. This is the day of being virtual, being able to run a business from your mobile phone. I mean, it's it's incredible. Companies are getting smarter. They're, they're implementing more consumer protections. They're implementing more compliance training. They're doing more with respect to product research. If you do get involved and you make purchases of inventory, even on a voluntary basis, if you decide that this business is not for you, you can leave and have that inventory repurchased by the company. There's no other business that offers that kind of protection on a voluntary, self-regulatory basis. If you decide to look further into a network marketing business in order to generate more cash flow for your family, I would recommend reviewing the following four elements. First, is the product or service. And on the product or service, I would ask five important questions. One, do you like it? Is it something you would feel comfortable sharing with others? Two, is there a recognized need in the marketplace? It's hard to create a need if one isn't naturally there. Third, does the product meet that need? Does it solve a legitimate problem for consumers? And fourth, is it priced to sell? Can it compete in the marketplace? And fifth, is it price for profit? Is there enough margin for the company and the distributor to be able to generate income for the long term? 
If you can answer the questions on the product to your satisfaction, the next element to consider is the company itself. Is it well run? Do you believe in the founders or the management team? Do you feel they have what it takes to go all the way? See, it doesn't matter how good the product is if the management can't take care of the company. Good management can change with the times. They can handle adversity. They can make good decisions. Make sure you choose a company that can serve you for a long time. The third element to consider is the compensation plan. And with that, there are three important things to look at. First, a brand new person needs to be able to generate some money fairly quickly. It may be an obvious reason, but you can probably imagine the ripple effect of a distributor getting involved and having even a small victory fast. That can only help with the overall success of the organization. Second, a person should be able to develop a moderate part-time income in a reasonable period of time. As they develop their network and as their sales grow, they should be able to enjoy more benefits. And third, for the people who are really serious, for those who decide to really go pro in the network marketing profession, there should be the possibility to make a serious full-time income if they work hard and are committed to developing their skills. If you're comfortable with the product, the company, and the compensation plan, the last thing you should look at is the support that will be made available to you. Does the company have a website? Does it, does it have a solid online reporting tool? Do they have comprehensive training available? Do they host events to help you build your business? If you decide to do this, what kind of a support system can you plug into? Choosing a network marketing company is a personal decision. But evaluating the four elements of product, company, compensation plan, and support is a great place to start. Is the company promising that you're going to get rich quick or that you can make a lot of money without a lot of effort? That's a red flag. Is there a product that you really believe in that you think can be sold? Or are you being told by salespeople or the person who's trying to recruit you or by the company itself that don't worry about the product, all you have to do is recruit other people into the business? Red flag, warning sign. If you're hearing that, take a second or even a third look. Get to know the customers, the products, the business, have some success, and see where the opportunities might take you to move up in the organization. You want to find out how concerned are they about my education, my training, and my development? Is there a space for me to grow? Most important question. Learn everything that you can about the product. Make sure it's something that you believe in. And learn everything you can about the industry and work that system. You have to be very passionate about whatever that company is doing. I would get involved. You can always test drive anything, you know, the product, the service, the community. And, um, and then lean into it a bit. If it feels good, then lean into it a lot. Behind me is the Lincoln Memorial. And this is a place where Martin Luther King Jr. had his famous I Have a Dream speech. And at that speech, he talked about his dream for equality for everyone around the world. And that's a noble dream. But I think more people need to remember what it was like when they were kids and the dream was still alive in them before it got beaten out of them by reality, by this paycheck, by these responsibilities, and by having to live for this job to pay the bills. I think people need to remember that, go back to that. Once they know that there's a better way, I think their future is gonna be much brighter. They can live a better life. So if you're considering getting involved in a network marketing company, let me offer you just a few pieces of advice. First, network marketing isn't perfect. It's emotional. It's challenging. Like any entrepreneurial venture, it can have its up days and its down days. But if you have an entrepreneurial bone in your body, it's just better. Second, if you're going to do it, decide to be professional. Decide to go pro. It's better to do that than just be this amateur sticking your toe in the water. Third, as any professional, you're going to have to learn some new skills. And I promise you, inside of the network marketing profession, they're not too difficult to learn. Fourth, like anything worthwhile, it's going to take some time. Don't expect that you're going to get to the finish line right out of the gate. And fifth, it's worth it. It's worth it to be able to take charge of your life again. 
It's worth it to be able to control your own financial situation. It's worth it for the people you're going to be able to spend time with. It's worth it for the things you're going to be able to see and the experiences you're going to be able to experience. It's worth it for the causes you're going to be able to contribute to, the lives you're going to be able to touch, the customers you're going to be able to help, the friendships you're going to be able to develop. I promise you, it's worth it. Remember, most people are searching for answers just like you are. But I do have to tell you the catch to network marketing. If there is a catch, if you want to understand this from uh, a, an emotional point of view, people say, well, it sounds too good to be true. It's not, it's hard work. But here's the catch. Most people still don't understand it. So you're going to have to endure the loss of social esteem from ignorant people. The uneducated will think less of you. Now, if you can handle that, you're on your way. If that's going to destroy you, you know what? Entrepreneurship in general probably isn't in your future. If you can face that catch, you can become unstoppable. I want everyone to really contemplate this if they're not in network marketing. You're in a job, you probably have a mortgage, you have rent, you have debt, whatever's going on. You're in a prison. You work just hard enough to keep them from firing you and they pay you just enough to keep you from quitting. <laughs> I've been there, done that, and bought that t-shirt. In network marketing, if you run into failure, it, it's really just a, a homework lesson for yourself. You really, there's no one to blame. You really have no excuse not to be successful. You just don't. <laughs> people don't want to hear that, but there's so much available to you. If you want to be a good network marketer, be a student to the people above you, be a fellow traveler to the people on the same level, and be a teacher to those below, and know when it's appropriate to do which. People who are not afraid of asking people to buy things, or not afraid of persuading people with a chance they may say no, these people own the future. Nothing happens until something moves. So you gotta go move, you gotta go do something, or nothing's gonna change in your life. In the beginning, you're gonna do a lot of things that you don't get paid for. But as you go down the road, you get paid for a lot of things that you don't do. And your job is rehabilitating the spirit, the entrepreneur spirit in all of us. You give it back. Either give it a strong yes, or a strong no, but no wishy-washy, dilly-dally stuff in the middle. There's dreams and there are nightmares, but I believe that the biggest nightmare of all is when you don't pursue your dream. You're gonna see some monumental growth in this profession. It's an exciting, exciting time to be involved with the network marketing profession. The next 10 years, I see just exponential growth. When that tipping point comes, it's not a matter of asking somebody, have you ever heard about network marketing? You're really asking them, which company are you building your wealth in. We are here to fix the world, to improve relationships with other people, to improve other lives. And the real reward comes as an entrepreneur in any level from teaching somebody something and watching them soar. There is no greater reward. Life's too short to spend it living someone else's dream instead of your own. It's too short to spend it living at a fraction of your potential. Can being an entrepreneur be a challenge at times? Sure, but here's what you get in exchange. It can be yours, something that you built, something that you created, something that you made happen. This balloon represents your dream. It represents entrepreneurship. My wish for all of you is that you would reach out and grab it. The choice is up to you.